this is the fourth and final part of the series dedicated to the B-58. We are going to cover what we did not cover at the beginning, the long and exciting story from its inception to its deployment. So please, stay till the end, because this story is not easy to find on YouTube, and if you stay till the end, YouTube will know that this is a good video, and it will show it to other people who may be interested. The Boeing B-47 and B-52 Strato IV Tress, uh, developed in the late 40s, represented the application of jet power to the conventional bombing concept of the day. Traveling at subsonic speed, the two big Boeings were intended to penetrate enemy airspace at great altitudes and were originally designed to carry conventional bombs and nuclear payloads as well. The supersonic B-58 Huster, on the other hand, derived from a new concept developed in the late 40s and early 50s. The concept started considering the fast increasing capability of ground defenses including radar tracking and surface-to-air missiles. On one hand, it was realized that the bomber of the future had to have the highest possible speed and therefore be capable of supersonic flight. This called for a relatively small aircraft of unconventional shape and with unconventional characteristics, for example, the Delta Wing, a droppable externally carried bomb pod was conceived from the beginning as a means of bomb release at supersonic speed. On the other hand, it was clear that the jet fuel consumption at supersonic speed would not permit the small aircraft to go all the way from its continental base to the target in the enemy territory flying at Mach 2. The bomber was therefore to be carried as a parasite under a large and slow transport aircraft. So the journey was divided into three zones. The logistics zone at the start, during which the parasite would be attached to the parent transport. Um, the combat zone near the enemy's border, where the parasite would be released. And the target zone, into which the short-range bomber would penetrate at supersonic speed to bomb and return to the parent aircraft. Contrary to what many think, low and high altitude were both considered as well. Convair firm of Fort Worth, Texas, uh, to be merged in 1954 with uh, General Dynamics, had been involved in advanced bomber design studies since October 46. At that time, it received a contract with the Air Force for a theoretical study of the long-range subsonic bomber of the future, known at the time as the GIBO, G -E -B -O, Generalized Bomber. Approximately 10,000 configurations on paper were studied and compared with respect to speed, range and gross weight, and involving different combination of wing area, aspect ratios, sweep back, turboprop and pure jet propulsion. I actually wonder where this number is coming from. It seems rather impossible in an era with no digital computers, but the sources say so and... Ultimately, this study led to an Air Force requirement for a medium bomber with a gross weight of 200,000 pounds, a radius of 2,000 miles and 10,000 pounds bomb load. On June 6, 1949, Convair received from the Air Force a contract to continue uh, the generalized bomber studies under the designation of GBO-2. Initially, they were called on to attempt to settle the turboprop versus turbojet power plant controversy and to apply the solution to a bomber with a radius of uh, 1,200 to 2,500 nautical miles, 10,000 pounds bomb load, cruising a uh, speed of over 450 knots, flight altitude above 35,000 feet. However, in April 1950, the Jebo 2 requirement was changed for a system able to attack targets 3,000 to 4,500 nautical miles distant at a speed between Mach 09 to 1.5. Convair had already proposed in January 1950 a small delta wing composite uh, carrying two men, which would be transported into the target zone by a B-36. 
with one engine in the tail, two droppable jet engines under the wings, and one in the tail of the long finned bomb pod, all without afterburners, the Parasite would have a launch weight of 100,000 pounds, would cruise to the target Mach 1.3, increasing to Mach 1.6 over the target, and reach a maximum altitude of 48,500 feet before pod release. After the attack, the return component would fly back to the B-36 with a single engine at Mach 0.9. A modification in the fall of 1950 involved two fixed jet engines buried in the wings, two droppable engines under the wings, and a fifth in the long streamlined pod, plus an advanced bombing navigational system. Both configurations featured passive electronic countermeasures, but no active defense. Originally, the pod was intended to carry conventional explosives, but early in the Jibo 2 program, a thermonuclear warhead was incorporated. The long finned and streamlined pod with a jet engine in its tail could function as an air launch missile, and as late as 1953, it was expected that the pod with propellant system and fins would have a range of 100 nautical miles. And this was an early interpretation of the standoff air to ground missile. Though the XB-55 had been cancelled, Boeing was working on a four-jet shoulder wing bomber, the Project MX-1022 with 47 degrees sweep back of the leading edge, a time reminiscent of that of the B-47, and a three-man crew. Uh, later this was to be referred as XB-59. The Air Force budget for the fiscal 1951 and 1952 supported both the Boeing design and the convergible to Delta Parasite, and in February 1951 both firms received phase one contracts. The Convair MX-1626 proposal was for a small delta wing bomber to be carried as a parasite under a turboprop power B-60, the swept back variation of the B-36. It would now have only three known afterburning engines, two fixed one in wing nacelles and one in the pod, a gross weight of 177,000 pounds, two-man crew, and a small landing gear to carry the weight of the return component only. During the Phase 1 studies of the MX-1626 proposal, the parasite approach was dropped in favor of in-flight refueling using the early probe and drug method just then coming into service. The expendable engine principle was also discarded and the MX-1626 design, which emerged in December 1951, was for a small delta with two fixed engines in nacelles in the wings, for the first time with afterburners and a long slender bomb pod, its nose extend forward beyond that of the aircraft and containing the ground search radar, the tail had three swept back fins and its upper surface was flush to the lower portion of the fuselage. With a crew of three, this craft had a radius of 2300 nautical miles from advanced bases or 4400 nautical miles in intercontinental operations, with a single outbound refueling. The bomb pod, functioning as an air-to-ground missile, had a range of 50 nautical miles. The progress of the two supersonic designs encouraged uh, the Air Force Directorate of Requirements to publish in December 1951 a General Operational Requirement GOR, for a strategic bombardment system ASAB-51, with a minimal operational radius, uh, using uh, the single refueling concept of 2,000 nautical miles. The ability to fly at 50,000 feet, but also low altitude capability at high subsonic speed and a maximum supersonic dash capability. Both Boeing and Convair competed for a contract. The Convair contender designated the MX-1964 resembled the MX-1626, but it had four jet engines with afterburners, impaired pods in each wing, takeoff gross weight increased to 140,000 pounds, the wing area was increased as well, it featured a delta wing with a sweep back of 60 degrees and a tail turret with an automatic cannon was added. Boeing continued work on their design, and now the MX-1965, but when both detailed Phase 1 designs were presented to the Air Research and Development Command in October 1952, the larger Boeing design was rejected 
as being less capable of achieving the specified supersonic performance. Considering that Boeing was already involved with the B-52 program, it seems a sort of fair decision. The Convert design was held to provide the most promising means of achieving supersonic capability with minimum size, thanks to the conveyor engineering staff's insistence on producing a high-density aircraft. In addition, Convair was four to six months ahead of Boeing in detailed design. So they received a full-scale phase one development contract using the MX 1964 design as a basis with the further instruction that the aircraft would be known as the B-58. It was at this time the Convair design staff was using the name Hustler to designate the MX 1964. To the regret of some, the name stuck and even became official in the end. But the rest was development and details, details, details. In March 1953, the aft fuselage was fined down under transonic area rule and the four engines were distributed in four separate stagger pods. The leading edge of the wing was cumbered and twisted to minimize the loss of efficiency at the tips. A small 10 degree trailing edge angle was added to the wing, increasing the area to uh, 1,542 square feet and the takeoff weight increased to 150,000 pounds. In September 1953, the four jet engines were again in twin pods, hung on pylons under the wing with added fuel for intercontinental flight in wingtip tanks. The search radar, which had extended out ahead in the nose of the bomb pod, was mounted in the nose of the aircraft, doubling the pod to be shortened. In August 1954, the airframe was redesigned for the last time in the light of the supersonic area rule. The jet engine nacelles were hung individually under the wings, the fuselage redesigned with additional room for fuel, permitting the tip tanks to be eliminated. Guys, take a decision. Wind tunnel tests confirmed that a significant increase in supersonic performance could be expected. And finally, this design was unchanged up to the date of the first flight, the 11th of November 1956. From this point on, we have already told the story of the B-58 and described its particularities, and now I invite you to refer back to the previous three parts of this series. This was quite a long series, it took quite a long time, but the B-58 was such an extraordinary plane that it utterly deserved it. So if you enjoyed this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. If you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching and see you the next time.